festival has been the subject of case studies in Harvard Business School for many years as cultural entrepreneurs. Being a dropout is very fashionable these days, so you were was way ahead of your time. I wasn't a dropout in the sense I didn't drop out, I was dropped out. Dropped out. Okay. <laughs> Non-fiction is like non-veg. Uh, it's a very, very vague word. Real spirituality you have to wrestle with yourself. There is so much broad material being sold in that field. I don't know, I wrote this on a phone actually. <laughs> 200 words a day also. Yeah, four but by it. Even those who we call illiterate are not illiterate. They have an oral tradition. They have thousands of years of literature in memory, in their understanding. Why are so many Indians have done so well? You know, Google, Sundar Pichai, and Microsoft Satya Nadella, and so many others. And the <laughs> answer all which I can relate to is saying, US men are Indians, they mind their own business. I do feel that my success as a writer yeah. comes from a certain irreverence of the system. <laughs> Namita, welcome. Super excited to have you on the Wonderful spot. to be with you. Thank you. And I'm glad you could make time for this. See, I have gotten to know about you, your work, and Jaipur Lit Fest about three years ago. As the first time I visited JLF, I have, of course, heard about JLF a lot. Somehow, you know, as a book lover, I think I wanted to go, but never got an opportunity. But my first time there, I was absolutely blown away. You know, such a vibrant setting. And to see so many fellow, you know, book lovers in one place, the you know, whole place was crowded. And uh, I didn't realize, you know, we, you, you get some of the best authors from all parts of India and all over the world. So, I mean, it's really a gem and something, you know, country should be really proud of. So I want to start there. How did, you know, JLF journey begin? You know, how did it come to be from, I'm sure it was like a startup once upon a time. And now it is from what I understand is probably the largest and most loved book festival in the world. You know, what an incredible journey. So tell us you know, a bit more about how this whole thing start. Well, it began in a combination of synchronicity and accident. Mm -hmm. You know, like nothing. Like startups. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, I mean, who, if you had told me 20 years ago mm -hmm. that I'd be sitting here having this conversation, I would have been very skeptical. But I'm a believer. And uh, in two, it's, I'm taking you back in time a little bit. This was in 2006, that we had the first edition of the precursor of the Jaipur Literature Festival, which was with the Virasat Foundation in Jaipur. But what had led to this is very interesting, because I had helped the ICCR, the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, to put up what was the first international festival of Indian literature. I don't know if it was the first, but we called it the first in Nimrana. And... Uh, and also in Delhi. And at that time, um, Mukesh, I realized something which was very disturbing for me, which was that the Indian languages were more or less neglected in our own assessment of our own literature. That was a time when English was riding high. Um, our friend Salman Rushdie had written an introduction to a book where he had said, oh, nothing much of value in the Indian languages. Uh, Kushwan Singh, very, very dear to me, had written somewhere, there's no vocabulary in the Indian mm. And the Indian, because the English writers were getting dollar advances, doing well, yeah. Indian writers, they weren't so savvy with media. They, it wasn't, they, so there was, in one side, resentment from the Indian languages, and there was um, disdain or condescension from the English. Not everywhere. I mean, I think Vikram Seth has a great understanding of Indian literature, but no, they were not they were not close to each other. And a thought struck me that when the Indian languages are talking to each other and treating English as another Indian language, which it is, yeah. they have the largest population of English speakers anywhere in the world. Is that true? Of course. Wow. Maybe not as a first language, but maybe as a first language we'll but it is enormous. That's incredible, you know. It's uh, and worth remembering. And mo more and more of them are owning up to the language and making it their own. Right. So these distances, I said when the, to myself, that when these distances are bridged, mm -hmm. then we can look at the concept of many languages, one literature, mm -hmm. all our literatures mm -hmm. coming together, yeah. then we are somewhere. And the root of it is translation. And uh, well, today it's happened. 
So that was my vision behind the Nimrana Literature yeah. Festival, which led to the Jaipur. A Jaipur literature. No, that idea is, I mean, that's uh, quite incredible to look at. You know that uh, one is creating a festival which is going to, in some ways, do justice to and represent, you know, the diversity of Indian languages and very rich heritage of, you know, literature. Say, growing up in a school, I grew up in a small town, Haridwar, and you know, studying Hindi in school. Will all this read about all these authors, you know, which are from fifty, you know, seventy years ago, Munshi Premchand yes. and Jay Shankar Prasad and so on. And we'll think like that was a golden era of you know Hindi literature. It, but abhi kuch nahi dikhta tha, right? So abhi you know with the with the festival, you know, I think you said uh, 22 languages are represented, and we get a lot of participation from all these languages. I also like how you put you know that in some ways we have, English is also now one of our own. I think think of English one of 22 languages is a great framing and probably right would look because we also we have in some ways we, we, we use this phrase English now, like we have you know yes. Indianized English to a very large extent. It belongs to us. Right. But, you know, um, they say a language is a dialect mm. with an army and a navy. Mm. So really, there's a power structure behind everything. Yes. The economics of a nation, um, the Shakespeare's genius mm. and Queen Elizabeth I and that moment in British history, mm. there was lots happening between all those things. Similarly, in India, I mean, we have a huge population, a literate population, a lot of them. Yeah. Even those who we call illiterate are not illiterate. Yeah. They have an oral tradition. Right. They have thousands of years of literature in memory, in their understanding. The Mahabharat and the Ramayana bring every uh, part of India together. So we have a huge, huge, huge living literary heritage. And once we accept all of it, which I think is happening. So I think it's the energy of Indian literary culture mm -hmm. and also our openness. In fact, our eagerness mm -hmm. to learn from other literatures. That's amazing. I mean, each dialect is a, has an army and navy with it, you know, similar to pen is mightier than sword in some ways, right? And, you know, in using 22 languages, we are talking about the official languages plus English. But we have to think of the dialects, the mother tongues, yeah. So this time we had Santhali writers, we had Gond writers. Mm -hmm. the, the tribal heritage of yeah. India is enormous, yeah. the Adivasi writing. And that's also finding voice. Yeah. Because when you are able to tell your own story, yeah. it is the most empowering thing in the world. I mean, I'm quite intrigued, Namita. I mean, I'm, I know you are a prolific writer and we'll come back to you know your writing. But I can already see that you have a lot of interest in the huge diversity of Indian literature, culture, heritage, in some ways also see as a one continuum. Of For course. you, it's not about, you know, just literature is just one genre, but everything else is different. Like you, It's like one seamless thing, including oral traditions. Yes, and languages and the history of those literatures. Because literature is never by itself. It's, it's a seashore which retreats, returns. We are all a part of that infinite horizon of that. For example... If I can divert a little, but we are coming back to the to the circularity of literature. You know, um, long, long ago, there's a language which was very popular in India, which was known as Peshachi, Jabhut Pasha. Okay. And um, the Katha Sarik Sagar was first written there mm -hmm. in as Brahat Katha mm -hmm. by Gunanth. Yeah. And then Somdev wrote it as Katha Sarit Sagar. Mm -hmm. Then the Arabian Nights mm. took from it. It traveled. These stories have traveled. Similarly, the Panchatantra yeah. has traveled around the world. And this traveled back to India. So, and another thing is that in this literary diversity, I'm trying to explain the spirit behind right. the Jaipur Literature mm. Festival. That in Kalidas, uh, Sanskrit mm. and Prakrit yeah. were both represented. Mm. In Shakuntala, yeah. the uh, charioteer, Talks in Prakrit yeah. and the king talks in Sanskrit. So, matlab, um, it was all there, high art, low art, yeah. as it was in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, so this um, constant multiplicity of voices in India, which we accept, yeah. is the greatness of literature everywhere. Incredible. And you know, the Indian literature. It's not just Jankari here. 
आप लाइक रेगुलर भी पढ़ते हैं रिसर्च करते हैं लाइक हाउ डू हैव सो मच नॉलेज कि कालिदास ने कौन सी लैंग्वेज कालिदास क्योंकि मैंने एक किताब लिखी थी शकुंतला नॉट अबाउट दैट शकुंतला शकुंतला इन दो बट ये थोड़ा अपनी नॉलेज है थोड़ी बड़े दिग्गजों की बातें सुन के सीखा है डायनामिक्स Many years ago, Arunab Sinha, who is a very well-known translator, and gives one well, of our people who gives ideas, he said, "Namita, there is this writer called Manoranjan Bhapari, who writes in um, Bangla, but he doesn't speak any English, and his Hindi is poor. Do you want to call him? His biography is coming out." I said, "Of course, because we've got our own simultaneous process of translation. We don't have the mechanics, but." we frame it in the, the way ki multilingual conversation means the sense of it the sort of it gets uh, conveyed now he was born in bangladesh mm-hmm. as a hindu came here dalit did something i don't know what that landed him in jail jail was a great uh, boon for him he learned to read and write <laughs> then he came out he was driving a rickshaw pulling ujwale in calcutta mm. oh, i don't know driving or pulling yeah and calcutta the pulling wale hote the spirit pehle oh no mujhe to pulling bataya tha and mahashweta devi was sitting and he asked her about something she had written acha she was surprised right. and he's asking he turned out he was a great reader mm. she said why don't you write something he wrote it she published it yeah. now he came to jaipur mm. he was recognized for his talent there mm. many So he got a literary agent many publishers came to him his books have been translated into eight languages he's been a runner up in the jcb prize twice mm. i mean this has happened before my eyes that he has right. become a literary star mm. why because there were no gatekeepers right he was just a talent not every talent can make it but his talent made it again luck synergy genuine uh, so i it's not just about the big stars it's about understood understood and anybody who can make it who has that spark right and was that a effort to you know unearth all these um authors from all these you know 22 language plus dialects because they are also not necessary very visible something you know you will see in the newspaper etc so how did you in jlf you know build that network of all these authors so you know which is was truly representing you know what india is all about it happens organically we have two advisors across rajasthan because rajasthan itself has such a rich oral heritage mm-hmm. and for me it's it's very easy to divide india literate illiterate mm-hmm. but the illiterate sometimes know as much right. if not more than a um, surface literate yeah. and the oral literature of rajasthan is so enormous there are ballads there are story uska we tried very hard to we always try very hard to present that then uh the sahit academy we go to them for inspiration they do very good work then you know each two writers three writers that you know yeah. they come up with namita ji iska dekhiye inka kaam dekhiye inka kaam dekhiye so i uh, we get spontaneously access to these people that's amazing i think you know what uh, and jlf is doing for the you know literature and also for culture of india is outstanding it's just going from strength to strength i know like now the festival has even gone to many parts of the world many you guys have a full kind of want to talk a bit about that you yeah. both the idea behind you know why to take it into europe you know to america and uh, what what's the inspiration behind taking it there and what kind of reception you get in this country it, again it, it just happened on its own there were people who would come to the festival who loved the festival and they suggested to us it was suggested we bring the festival to london mm-hmm. we did it in the south bank then we been doing it 10 years now at the british library and uh, we get audiences which are very do they know that okay june there'll be a festival they they watch out for it these are both 
uh, diasporic Indian writers, Indian, uh, not only Indian, South Asian, mm-hmm. Pakistanis, yeah. Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans, Nepali people. Mm-hmm. There's a common literary footprint around all these. Because, um, so they come and uh, international audiences come. So that's London. Then Boulder, mm-hmm. somebody from Boulder, Colorado came and said, we want to do it there. I have a good instinct. Uh-huh. And uh, I told Sondra, Sondra, this will happen. <laughs> and I, I couldn't even imagine Boulder, right. Colorado. Okay. But uh, Sondra went there, visited, uh-huh. and somehow that festival has been going on and on. Mm-hmm. It is my favorite festival yeah. of all the festivals <laughs> in the world wow. that we do. Right. Boulder has the highest per, ca- per not capita, per per square mile population of Nobel laureates anywhere in the world. Incredible. Or something like that. Wow. It is, it is a very learned city. Mm. And uh, it's a very um, liberal city. Mm. But we also have se- uh, festivals in Houston. Mm. We have festivals in New York. Right. This year we are going to Seattle. Mm. Seattle should be of special interest to you techie types. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's there. Yeah. No, so is Boulder, I think. We'll talk about mountains later. I yes. know, like, you are super inspired. Uh, but I can imagine in Boulder, all these Nobel Prize winners surrounded with mountains, reading books, having the intellectuals. Books. It's, yeah. it's a very gentle place. But we also have very regular sessions in um, Australia, uh-huh. in the past in Melbourne and in Adelaide and right. in different parts there. We've had one in Qatar, in Doha. Yeah. It's so inspiring. I think, you know, it's not... It's Spain. A, and, right. Okay, this ah, one I have to tell. Sure. This is the most exciting. Okay. Last year, we had a session, a festival mm. in Madrid and then Valladolid, mm. uh, which is a beautiful town, very learned again, university town in uh, mm. Spain, not yeah. far from Madrid. And uh, it was in English mm. and Spanish right. and some Sanskrit. So we broke out of the... Mm. Trope of only English. Mm. Amazing. See, I have to tell you, Namita, I think this this conversation and what you are doing at JLF is, you know, is it's really inspiring for me, you know, for two reasons, you know. One is, I personally, you know, always love books. Like, I, for me, you know, books have been like my closest friends. I kind of discovered books in my late teens and now it's been 30 years, you know, I read voraciously. But there's a caveat which I need to fix going forward. Then I have a non-fiction I have a lot of non-fiction Science, history, you know um, Politics, uh, social science wo, Biographies and so on Fiction is very But I think fiction, you know I do want to Like fiction, then, in some ways, you know Real human stories, you know Come out in that It will happen in its own time right, huh. There's a time in your mind When you're ready to take in stories yeah. There's a time in your mind when you're mm. keen to learn and get to the heart of it. Right, so right. Don't, uh, uh-huh. don't, don't treat fiction like a chore. It'll run after you. Chore nahi paayega. And yeah, well, and that happens every time I pick up a fiction book. But I enjoy it five times more than a non-fiction book. But though, bandi nahi kar pata, right? You know, so. Alag alag samay mein alag alag chite sam. But but mm. um, if I could just clarify yeah. that I am not responsible for the Jaipur literature mm. festival. There is three of us. There is the producer, Sonjoy right. Roy, mm. who knows books, understands books, right. but is also a very deep theater person. Mm. So, and uh, um, his company, Teamwork, has great organizational genius, yeah. let's say, to the extent that our um, mm. festival has been the subject of case studies in Harvard Business School for many years yeah. as cultural entrepreneurship. Right. And there's my co-director, William Dalrymple, who he and I share the same instinct, but very different canvases. Mm. He, a um, historian, knows a lot about art mm. and is well entrenched in the Western world right. while knowing a lot about mm. Indian history. Um, my canvas is different and more erratic. So you, well, you like to explore and... Yeah. We all like right, to explore. Right, 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 right. So it's the three of us mm. right. and the combination of our different perspectives mm. and our trust in each other. And our support of you. Right. And 17 years for this three-legged stool to hold together. <laughs> no, three, three legs provide a really good balance. Two <laughs> legs, you know, much harder to balance. But see, look, this whole JLF story is, you know, see, a lot of what we in this podcast we do, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. We discuss entrepreneur story. But I'm seeing, you know, so much parallel. It's, you know, started with an initial idea, inspiration, some conviction. It took its own journey. I'm sure there were some ups and downs also along the way. 20 years down the line, it has become probably much bigger than anyone ever thought because, you know, that's keep 
kept getting better there was genuine passion and interest in you know building something so time was right i feel uh, see india mein i think pichle 20 years mein kafi sea change hua i think you you know where you started ki 20 saal pehle it was almost a matter of pride ki english use karna hai western lagna hai so one thing i like i've already mentioned i think spot plus once but i'll mention again ki aapko yaad hoga 30 saal pehle shaadi mein log sab suit pehen ke aate the right it was a big thing ko shaadi ho rahi hai to suit silwana hai no tie lagake jana hai humne india mein up mein goa chote shehar mein suit tie ki kya zarurat hai abhi lag sab log sherwani pehen ke aate hain no kurta pajama pehen ke aate hain lekin things are changing because see as india is doing well economy we economically we are also discover who we are where we come from what is our original voice and this where i think literature has a huge role to play especially celebrating your know, diversity of indian literature which is where so i think jlf also is in sir helping develop the consciousness of the country right which i think all of us are indian also seeking you know we can't just keep looking westward and see ki you know how how should our uh world view ideology should be shaped like we have so much tradition so history much. you know when which can be only be told through literature in many ways so i think what you said there are two or three keywords mm. you said celebrating literature yeah. and i really think that india and south asia mm. is a celebratory culture mm. whatever we do we do it joy right. and it's that joy that brings in the special quality of the lit fest yeah. um lot of my dear friends from around the world have said that in some of the major festivals very learned mm-hmm. festivals bude bude bazur bazur log aate hain but in jaipur right. it's young people yes. and they are brighter than the brightest mm-hmm. so that's a very important yeah. part of it and the other thing is a lot of the diaspora who comes from across they come to jaipur for 2 3 days mm-hmm. to rediscover what is almost a cross section right. of right. india right, right. you you just if every time there are four or five sessions mm-hmm. going on uh if you look at the range of those sessions yeah. you see so many different aspects 100% i mean i can vouch for it right now i've been to jail for last 3 years in a row and yeah it's packed with youngsters you know a lot of people in their 20s and they seem to be having great time and you know going for running from session to session yeah, like right? energy it's, machine they right. pump out energy that's right that's right yeah. and yeah. the other thing is that the jaipur literary festival has helped to forge a literary community right our authors mm-hmm. meet authors from other worlds yeah. and those people also meet mm-hmm. and the world is actually just a small town you know right. it's not such that's a chota right. sa to planet right. 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 some uh, thori bhasha hai usme right. we, we need to come together as mm-hmm. humans sharing our stories because we've got to remember that language was the first and greatest evolutionary tool right. i don't know if birds have languages <laughs> but it hasn't helped them evolve too much i mean <laughs> yeah. their language but here three thing is shared consciousness because of language that's right what and even understanding our own thoughts yeah because of language right. so language is most primary tool and every religion accept that in the beginning was the word ya yeah, wa right. yeah. you know it so words and stories mm. and each other's stories and right. each other's narratives yeah. that is what brings us together no 100% and look language definitely you know what enable us to collaborate and societies evolve and have you know shared context and all of that but what's even more fascinating is now even you know the cutting edge of ai we are coming around to today you know not going too much into detail but this whole idea of a large language model on which chat gpt is based it's basically we are able to um, you know mimic human intelligence just by processing language Absolutely. so like such a deeper connection between language and you know our intelligence and our basic intelligence yes. is yes, is language yeah, yeah. so and even the ai i mean i'm not afraid of ai i'm uh, cautious like everybody else but watching excitedly hoping in my lifetime yeah. i'm not a young woman i i see all these changes that mm-hmm. are coming yeah. because i feel with ai mm-hmm. somewhere we'll return to a mass shared consciousness mm, that's right. like i'm not afraid of ai inspired mm. stories because yeah. they come from all mm. stories stories that's right that's right. 100% i think it's very fascinating time and evolving it's very fast time of mass dreaming that's right yeah. almost yeah 100 percent I want to take you back to you know early days of your career. I think I was reading in your biography that you started this magazine when you were sixteen. No, no, that older. You were okay. You were nineteen. Nine. Twenty. Okay. okay, it's still it's still almost a teenager, right? Which is you know that must be I'm guessing probably late sixties, early seventies. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll give you the whole right. timeline. Okay, tell me. It's it's a chronology, Sanjeev. Yeah. So I was born in fifty six. Hmm. 
and born in Republic Day. Yeah. I was named Republica. Then I changed my name. And uh, I so studied English literature right. and loved English right. literature, right. truly. Mm. But loved literature. Sure. And when I was in college, in Jesus and Mary College, mm. we had a, a course on um, Chaucer. Mm. And I realized there was an alternative paper called Paper 8B, I still remember, mm. on modern Indian literature, uh-huh. which nobody was doing. Yeah. And Usme, you had to study Hindi literature uh-huh. in that time. Now there are many such courses, mm. but there was only this one in Delhi University. Mm. And um, I remember there were... There was Mohan Rakesh. There was Vaishali ki Nagar Vadhu. There were some books. There were some... And my my spoken Hindi was good. My written Hindi was very poor. But I said, I want to do this paper. So I tried to find out the paperwork. It was not clear. Mm. The nun was both a friend of mine and extra strict with me. Mm. So in the end, even though I had been in the, uh, topping Delhi University on and off, but... When I went to give fill in my paper for 8B, uh, she said, you can't do it uh, because you don't have attendance for it. Mm. Attendance? That, for that paper. That I said, but how can I have it? No, they're not teaching it. Yeah. I was short of 0.6% attendance. Mm. Uh, There's a very famous case where um, almost 140 students mm. of JMC were held back were shortage of attendance. Wow. <laughs> and those days, you know, there was mm. 10% discretion with the principal. Mm. She didn't use it. And we went to court. And in fact, Arun Jaitley was our lawyer. He was a young lawyer at that time. <laughs> My father-in-law was a law minister. Uh. Emergency agai. Underground. It was an ups and downs right. way. <laughs> ki unhone ka, you'll have to repeat the year. Mm. I said, I'm not repeating it. This was in your final year. So sorry. I said, I'm not doing it. Right. Most people repeated it. Mm. So I'm confessing to you right. that I'm not. I have given the paper. But See, look, being a dropout is very fashionable these days. So you were fashionable wasn't? way ahead of your time. But I wasn't a dropout in the sense I didn't drop out. Right. I was dropped out. Dropped out. Okay, yeah. But I could have gone back. Well, then sometimes greatness is thirst upon you. So no, Really, I do feel that my success as a writer yeah. comes from a certain irreverence mm. of the system. If I'd be, I wanted to right. be a professor. Mm. If I'd been a professor, I would have written very boring academic books. Mm. I'm not saying my books are better or worse, but mm. I have more fun writing. Right. So you were dropped out because of 0.6% delta in no, attendance? Because, and also because I wanted to do modern Indian literature. Ah. So uh, everything is a vindication of that, mm. that today I'm sitting in a system <laughs> yeah. where modern Indian literature mm. translations are more important right. than anything. Else. That's amazing. I mean, this is uh, you know, roughly, let's say, I don't know, 45 or so years ago, you were kind of you faced resistance in your college because you wanted to do you know, modern Indian literature. And here you are, you know, part of this such massive festival which is celebrating modern Indian literature in basically it's all its avatar and all its, you know, but colorful, you know, vibrancy. Please remember, we are one of many festivals. Of course, of course. Across, what is most joyous mm. is that this idea yeah. has been picked up right. across India. Right. Small towns right. have competing festivals. Mm. I'm from Uttarakhand. Right. And there's people who are running festivals in small villages mm-hmm. because people are hungry to right. read, to expand their mm-hmm. horizons. And, you know, um, television, Netflix, mm-hmm. all these, they are passive entertainment. Right. They are also great, mm-hmm. but they don't test your brain. Right. They don't challenge you to make your own interpretation. No, absolutely. And, and as a reader, I realize, you know, there is, you can actually almost have a dialogue with a book. Yes. You read something and then some thought triggers, you know, then you can pause. Yes. And you can indulge in the thought, you know, in the Netflix, the things are happening so fast. You're just consuming like, you know, just uh, sitting and also, dead duck in yes. front, you know. And, and also, the writer is giving you space to draw your own conclusions, to share his or her conclusions. But a film is is um, engineered or wired differently to say, Ab inko rulao. <laughs> right, yeah. Ab inko smile kar, which is great. I mean, it's it's great. I'm not getting uh, the They're getting too language important. of films. But I, I think books, right. that, and I'm an obsessive uh, watcher of mm. films and things. So I don't even have a TV anywhere near me. Right, right, right. I don't watch anything. So let's go back to so after being dropped out. So you started your magazine yes. around that 1920, right? Which is, I mean, again, a very bold move, you know, and that you, I think, already mentioned that was before around emergency time, you know, very turbulent times in India, like, you know, just almost forced to, you know, uh, dropped out of college and 
मुझे जिद आ गई नहीं मैं नहीं पढ़ना है आप लोग पढ़ो पढ़ाओ सिखाओ आई एम नॉट कमिंग बैक टू कॉलेज बिकॉज आई एम वेरी आई मीन आई डेंट फील लाइक डूइंग इट अगेन सो इट वॉज मे बी नॉट अ वाइज मूव बट आई थिंक वर्ल्ड वॉर वेल सो देर इज डेफिनेट वाइज मूव बट आई एम मोर इंटरेस्टेड नहीं क्यों आप देन आई वॉन्ट टू डू सम बाइंग एंड सो द आइडिया केम अप डूइंग अ फिल्म मैगजीन सो ही स्टार्टेड आई वॉज दिस वॉज इन um 1977 that we started it so i would have been 21 right but right. that was just chalu gaya us almost but, but uh, I mean, my father and law you have to remember i was part of the privileged power structure mm-hmm. though we were resisting it mm-hmm. me and my husband we were, right. it was not something we believed in mm-hmm. but i've always grown up in new delhi and in its mm-hmm. comfort and protection right. of itself but i started this magazine bef- in uh when was it we began it mid 77 acha okay. that we brought us together uh-huh. and i said i want to do a different sort of magazine mm-hmm. it was called super right and um, i was raw famous was our editor uh-huh. and he was 28 and 28 seemed like <laughs> what a old man we brought in yeah. <laughs> and all the staff was very young and i'm still in touch with many of mm-hmm. them and it was a vibrant young magazine mm-hmm. which looked not just it looked at gossip because gossip is a very serious uh, genre mm. and um, S- 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 shobha dev was already demonstrating her genius almost yeah. with stardust mm. but ours was little more um, it was different mm. and it ran for 7 years it did very very well but then somehow we could not sustain it so you could say somewhere i'm an entrepreneur at heart because i was not the editor of that magazine i was the publisher mm. and um, i was behind the scenes so that was my first entrepreneurial kick the buzz you get out of watching an idea you say i want to do this as far as i mean you are a big entrepreneur but in my um, what do you say minuscule way i would say it comes to taking an idea to breaking it into its components is how i look at it i am looking back at some of these things also their precursor to you know what's to come i think you're also the finding yourself like you know in the early 20s having the courage to start your own thing running through seven years despite with the privilege you know there is also not all about finances also about what will other people think Absolutely. or with the family yes i mean ki dekho itna padh ke ab isse film magazine shuru kari yeah. but it was a very good magazine so now i want to ask you a question because i'm deeply interested in your story i want and i see you as a serial entrepreneur that it's not just what you are doing yeah. why you are doing it but it's the same excitement of the entrepreneurial spirit so i want me to i want you to tell me about your journey as an entrepreneur but not just the linear journey what is an entrepreneur who is an entrepreneur why are you an entrepreneur dekhiye my entrepreneurial journey you know i think the seed was sowed when i was in college so i started reading at that time and i read these two books uh, one by sam walton made in america one is akio marita who is sony's founder mm-hmm. i think made in japan something like that and uh, this idea of you know here are these people who in their i think in their 30s had an idea they started something in one store sony used to sell some electronics you know so back end machines and in their lifetime they built this you know giant corporation which eventually became the number one their field and it's such massive impact so that you know the that is romantic idea of entrepreneurship was born ki mujhe lage mere ko to yahi karna eventually pehla job was in a big company ha so can i ask you interrupt sure would you say that somewhere every entrepreneur mm-hmm. is a dreamer oh 100% you know and i think you have to have some dream that you believe in aapko kuch pata nahi ko kaise hoga kab hoga aapka na resources hai na skill set hai but wo dream इतना विविड रियल लगता है एंड आई एम ऑथर्स का वैसे ही होता होगा ना कि वो बुक्स के बारे में एटलीस्ट यू विजन यू एंड यू एंटर दैट विजन जस्ट लाइक एन ऑन एंड एंड यू इट्स वेरी पेनफुल टू पुट एवरीथिंग इन वर्ड्स जस्ट लाइक फॉर यू इट्स वेरी पेनफुल आई एम श्योर टू आई रन आउट ऑल द डिटेल करेक्ट करेक्ट सो टेल अस मोर अबाउट द ऑन्टरप्रेन्योर हाँ तो उस वक्त सीड वॉज बॉर्न एंड उसको पता नहीं था कि कब कैसे करना है माई फर्स्ट जॉब इज ए बिग कंपनी विच आई डेंट लाइक 99 में जो सिलिकन वैली वाज यू नो द डॉट कॉम बूम वाज इन फुल स्विंग 
और वहाँ पे शिकागो में बैठे हम लोग को लग रहा था कि यू नो जस्ट मिसिंग आउट कि हमारा गैस रिवोल्यूशन ऑफ ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी हमारे सामने हो रहा है और हम दूर से देख रहे हैं तो आई क्विट माई जॉब ड्रोव टू यू सिल्कन वैली ट्राई टू स्टार्ट ए कंपनी उसको बिल्कुल पता नहीं था तो कुछ हुआ नहीं बट फिर सात आठ साल वहाँ पर काम किया इन स्टार्टअप्स एंड आई लर्न ए लॉट फिर दो हज़ार सात में इंडिया आके इन्होंने इंटरेस्ट स्टार्ट किया वहाँ सो दिस अ फॉलो अप क्वेश्चन टू दिस वाई एंड हाउ इज इट वॉट्स द रीजन बिहाइंड द ऑलमोस्ट अ जीनियस ऑफ इंडियन माइंड इन हेल्पिंग सिलिकॉन वैली फाइंड इट्स ओन स्टोरी सी अब आई वॉज एर इवेंट रिसेंटली इट वॉज um basically more or india us collaboration and somebody asked this question to you know um uh, somebody else on stage ki how why are so many indians have done so well you know google sundar pichai and microsoft satya nadella and so many others and the guy answer all which i can relate to singhi us men are india they mind their own business oh. <laughs> they don't know see about which is you know i think i've seen little bit you know so when is first of all the some of the in some ways people who are who had a really good education and some way filtered already in the indian system they end up going to us so you are it's not you know yeah you are already privileged in some ways knowledge wise opportunity wise education wise a uh, second thing it is true i think you know we as indians i think are able to really focus on something stay for long period of time not get too involved see the if you look at the typical you know the image of a us the american ceo typically you know tend to be loud very much about themselves like very sir you know, become a mm, cult personality of one person but look at indian ceos they are very subdued you know like sundar mm-hmm. pichai said they, they talk to you so, so widely very low key it's never about themselves party i think liberal our heritage of as a collective culture where for all of us family society culture tribe is something more important yes. which i think so if you have the intellectual caliber ambition and able to get along with and take lot of people together i think was really well so in combination of all this i think today it's so many stats there nearly 35 40% of all startups in silicon valley are started by you know indian founders and so on it is incredible i think this impact is only going to grow in the coming decades that's fascinating and deserves a whole session by itself that's which right, we right. will talk about all right. thumb of, of cultural entrepreneurship technical technological entrepreneurship right. empathy all we we'll talk later you know, 100% i think there is you know yeah i think you have uh, brought up a topic which i deeply care about my whole career has been around entrepreneurship but i do see amita i've also seen the entrepreneurship is an idea which shows up in any act of creation yes i think it does not matter whether it is a festival or a book magazine you know or many things you have done right so i think sometime also people connect entrepreneur too much with the for profit company creation no. i think it could be cultural movement yeah. and so there is lot to learn from that and hence and going through you know your journey and things you have done i see you know as entrepreneur as any other entrepreneur you have created so many things uh, well, all your life i see it as excitement mm. energy yeah and also process right, you process. have to love process right, right. once i was told by an engineering friend that mm. engineering is about process yeah and i think storytelling is also a word process right. or breaking it down telling it into right. timelines into right. so uh, right. yes so let's let's go back to you know you yes. were talking about you know your magazine so, building experience do you, any any key learnings from that phase you know from your in your 20s you were doing this magazine about uh, uh, bollywood movies i don't know if you did from delhi or you moved to mumbai for that any key Between learnings from bombay and delhi uh, well i think what i because we had a small group of people there was rao who sadly left mm-hmm. the world there's so many others there who still remain friends it was about understanding the group energy yeah. of talented young people working mm-hmm. together that mm-hmm. was the most joyous part of it yeah. and after that it was also because i'd been chucked out of college because of mr chaucer and the watching what was happening in the linguistic framework of mm-hmm. those days Salman Rushdie had just written Midnight's Children mm. where he had written it in a very authentic language mm. of of Bombay. Yeah. He had owned up to that language. Mm. And even somebody like Shobha Dey was playing around with language mm. in Stardust. So when I wrote um the my first novel Paro mm. because when this magazine shut down I mm. said ab kya kare? Mm. So I said ab novel likhni chahiye. Right. 
And until then, I was writing short stories and poetry, mm-hmm. which was horrible. When I look, <laughs> thank God, none of it is around. <laughs> but I was trying to live up to this mm-hmm. intellectual self that had so abruptly been cut short with the mm-hmm. being thrown out of college or whatever, or walking <laughs> out of college, whatever you may call it. So then, this is the first time I felt liberated enough mm-hmm. to write a story in a free-flowing way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, using phrases... Um, which brought in Indian English quite unselfconsciously. Right. And I was, I mean, the sparrow is right here. This was your first book. I think you were 26 or so. I was 26 when I wrote it yeah. and 28 when it was published. And yeah. it has been in print for 40 years. And I'll tell you something which has got me very excited mm-hmm. is that um, Penguin, Penguin mm-hmm. India, one of my publishers, yeah. who uh, they are bringing it out as a modern classic. Mm-hmm. So for a book to survive for 40 years, yeah. it's a mystery, right. especially a comedy. This was a social mm-hmm. comedy. It shocked everybody because sexually it was a bit uh, frank. But more than anything else, it was a social comedy. Mm-hmm. I remember when I wrote it, my father found the manuscript somewhere. <laughs> he said, Beta, what is this? I said, I'm writing a novel. Right. He said, child, I hope you're being discreet. <laughs> I said, discreet? <laughs> discreet ki toh spelling hi nahi bata. <laughs> but, but it was... I'm so proud of this novel because mm. when young people read it now, yeah. they look at me with my grey hair and this old lady. They think, you wrote this? Yeah, yeah because it's, it's still current. It survived. So, you know, um, now I'm going back to uh, history. Sure. But Adi Shankaracharya uh. once said in the context of a biography of him that had been written, he told his... Uh, Totakacharya was one of his four disciples. Totakacharya ne ek biography likhi. And he was the least intellectual of Shankaracharya's um, dis- uh, disciples. So he wanted to be very, he said, Mary Likunga biography, likhi unko present ki un palm leaf. He said, Bhad achha ki But he said, Har kitab ki har kani ke kundali hoti. Or iski kundali me mujhe kuch ye dikha hai. You know, yaad rakho. And I've never forgotten, of course. I mean, he must have said it in very different words, but I've read the story. And I really believe every book has its own kundali, its own destiny. So, Paroki destiny is very strong. Which just didn't get that moment. I think that moment is when the public perception and your story match each other. But that's, uh, you know, as a, as a young author at that time and the first book to have this kind of run is just incredible. But I got a lot of flack in India. In India. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, I'm guessing a lot of listeners might not have read, but they should read. I am going to read for sure. But you tell me, you know, so this book Paro is really was, Paro was a very, I thought it was just a very funny book. And I wanted to move on to other books. And I look back, it's well structured, it's good. I was very lucky. Because my husband said, go to London and find a publisher. Mm. Wedding anniversary present, he gave me a ticket to London. And then don't come back without a publisher. <laughs> but I was fortunate. I went to an agent. I went Like in three days, I had two big companies mm. wanting it. It did very well. And then my career came to an end. Because after this book, because in India, everybody was saying, Ye kya hai? This is, what is this book? You know, mm. There was... Only Kiki Darwala wrote a good review. Some people were nice. Mm. But I was treated either as a flash in the pan mm. or what has she written? They were mm. shocked. Ki a nice middle class girl. Mm. Uh, how has she written such a book? So this, did the society of India at that time find it little, you know... They found it a bit disoriented. Disor- okay. bit, bit unconventional. So I said I'll impress them. So I tried to read very serious books. <laughs> in fact, they were so serious they were depressing. <laughs> and nobody wanted to publish those books. Mm. And ideally, I should have gone on writing the same book, but mm. I'm very quickly, my attention mm. gets on. For me, every book is a journey, every book is a quest. Yeah. So I wanted to explore something right. new. Mm. So the story I was writing mm. was a bit depressing. It was a story called The Himalayan Love Story. Mm. So nobody wanted to publish it. <laughs> so after this huge success, yeah. for 10 years, nothing I wrote got any success. Mm. Just rejection slips. So mm. from the fairy tale beginning to one bottom mm. of the pit. But one thing I am mm. is persistent. Right. I know. Mm. I'm, peach, I'm just... Just write it. I And slowly, and I had a very difficult time personally at that time. I lost my husband. This book was 
but I kept writing mm. and I climbed back. Because then people said, oh, this book we like, that book yeah. we like. So mm. my reputation built up and I don't have a very large readership, mm. but I do have a readership of people who read and appreciate me. Um, though I never, I don't have BA after my name, but there are a lot of people who have written PhD thesis <laughs> on my book. So for me, each book is a different journey. So, and, uh, and then I wrote this sequel to Priya. Yeah. Um, Paro, 25 years later, mm. came out as Priya. Mm. Uh, which, because Paro and Priya is the story of these two women, very mm. different women. In fact, the Oberoi bookstore is also there in it. Up to Hani, up to jewelry shop. But there was a, uh, so I'm feeling we are shooting here in the <laughs> Oberoi. Yeah. And it was about Delhi in those mm. days. And it, it captures a moment in time. And that moment in time captures the, uh, what is, imagination of current readers also. So who can tell? I say, I wrote a book called Things to Leave Behind, you know, which got the Sahitya Academy Award. So that was a very precious book for me because it was about, uh, I'm a Kumaoni, and it was about the history of Kumao. Uh, my great-grandfather had written a book called The History of Kumao, mm-hmm. Bidi Pandey. And um, I'd always passionately loved the landscape of the Himalayas. So that book was the serious book that gave me another sort of attention. But each book is so different that it's very difficult to um, almost say the same. The style is the same. I have a slightly bizarre sense of humor which comes through. Otherwise, each book is different. But now I've written 23 books out of which a lot of fiction, a lot of myth, and lot on the Himalayas. But it baad, I can see some patterns that okay, so all my books have this element of this mad woman coming in somewhere. All my books look like my latest book, which is here, it's called uh, Never Never Land. I don't know, I wrote this on a phone actually, <laughs> 200 words a day or something. Wow. Because I just wrote it too. I say I can't stop writing. The phone can be for use for something good as well. I managed it. <laughs> and then, when now I'm reading it again, because I, when I read it again, I realized that the two characters in Paro, which are Paro and Priya, here also there are two ladies. One is almost ni- beyond, you uh, know, mid-90s. And one is 102. Wow. And, but they are the same characters. Same characters. I mean, the same mm-hmm. type of personalities yeah. with the same dynamics between mm-hmm. them. So, you never know, human mind, we are all the time trying to process our experience. Right. You, already to share it. you mentioned persistence, right? I think it's 45 years you've been writing continuously, culminating these 23 books. And earlier you were mentioning you have few more book ideas in your head. Just uh, maybe talk a bit more about the process. You know, how does an idea take hold in your head? When do you know that you have to write a book? And what process you go through? Does it is there a research phase, or you know how do you commit to writing? And then you just measure two hundred words a day. No. What does your process look well, like? Two hundred is the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. If you can manage that, you, anybody can bring a book out. Mm-hmm. Because I believe first of all that everybody has two books inside. Them. Mm-hmm. One is the life they lived, yeah. mm-hmm. and one is the life they might have lived. Might yeah, incredible. And when you write about the life you have lived, mm-hmm. it becomes a sort of scrutiny, very deep scrutiny. Of your own life. Yeah. So even if it's not published, mm. your life script makes you a more grown up person because you sort of figure out, I did this wrong. Yeah. Perhaps I shouldn't have done that. It, mm. it's, it's a deep uh, self analysis. Mm. Though you may give it to another character okay. or another person, you will think that you're writing about somebody else. Yeah. And the second sort of story, which is about, is, is the dreaming mind, the adventures. Yeah. Maybe there's somebody who's never left their small town. But they, in their mind, they've been everywhere. Mm-hmm. That's their story. Uh, so powerful. I like, you know, want to repeat it, right? Because I'm able to resonate well, you know, just saying it. Every person has these two books inside them, right? Because yes. I have my own unique life experience that no one will have, right? And if I zoom out and look at like, that's an incredible, beautiful story that each of us live. And of course, all of us have unfulfilled dreams and aspirations and adventures, we either we not got the didn't get the opportunity or courage or risk or whatever it is. But there is, it's there upside, in our you know, imagines you know so which is. So I think these are the two, and so I think everybody for them to write their own story, yeah. their first story. 
and don't look at the success and all part of it that's just luck also persistence yeah. also mm-hmm. so many other things but if you writing that one story that examines your own life script mm-hmm. or writing that one story mm-hmm. that gives you a key to your unfulfilled dreams mm-hmm. these are the really important things and people can even if they never publish is probably still That's, useful to write right and now the thing is that everybody can publish yeah. because of the ease of technology mm-hmm. of publishing yeah. and there's according to me even if a book is shared with two people or three people yeah. that also mm-hmm. is very important if your great granddaughter can read the book maybe or there's a many look look you know let's say i don't know i mean i don't know much about my great grandparents but imagine if they wrote down something which i can read now i mean yes. the priceless to me like you know, which you know people listening to this podcast can at least think about doing that you know, recording the memories of the people in your mm-hmm. because everything is changing so fast yeah. mukesh it looks so um, pre cell phone and post cell phone yeah. pre computer and yeah. post computer it's a yeah. different sort of ad and bc kind of thing ce whatever you want to call these transitions but uh, these stories we are each other stories and um, long ago in uh, i'm forgetting which year was it maybe 99 or something i wrote a i wrote it for long i'm just for bad at numbers unlike you i wrote this book on mountain echoes reminiscences of kumauni women and i went to my grandmother and to three great aunts including the great writer gora pant shivani who was related to me and my grandmother shakuntala pandey and tara pandey who was a famous chayavadi poet of that time and and i found these people they were very old but they were very modern in their outlook so i got them to record their memories and i so oral history and then when i wrote it so it's across kumauni families especially diaspora families many of them have this book in their bookshelves because it gives people a and now when people from across the world are marrying into our family some spanish bahu hai to usko ka read this what yeah. because the stories are the same around the world and i use that as the research material for never uh, things to leave behind God. so like that it all feeds into each other into one uh, mass of information and research is so easy now right and since you mentioned you know kumayo you know i'm also i mean that other thing we share i also grew up in you know utra are to are utra rakhan ki you're a ko utra rakhan i have you know i didn't realize growing up but later on i realized you know it's love mountains there's something called mountain you go there and you know this whole perspective changes you start like most of problems just seem to melt away and brain start operating at a very different level and i know in a lot of your books you have used lot of mountain settings mountain people mountain culture folk tales from that just talk more about that you know your just your relationship with mountains okay so there's a line from the poet william blake says says great things are done when men and mountains meet this is not done by jostling in the street and i think the sea has its own wisdom it comes it retreats mountains stay there um, there was a facebook post i read of this very um, young pahadi woman who was going through some difficulties and she said main pahadi nahi main pahar hu and i really loved that and i like to think i'm be pahar hai and mountain communities around the world share a certain stubborn quality is what i have found i may be wrong and uh, right now i'm working on one of the most exciting projects i have ever done uh, i'm doing it with my old friend uh, dr malashri lal who was one of our professors in college though there's not much age difference between us and we work seamlessly together mm. so its project is called himalayan folk tales and folklore mm. and it looks we are trying to collect mm. folk tales from across the himalayas yeah. because in a while they'll all be lost because they are in small languages yeah. they are and trying to see the themes and stories yeah. of those young minds because those those stories are more innocent in a way but they also come from the same what i said pesha chi bhasha brahad ye kahaniya katha sarit sagar inhi cheezon se wo kahani hai ajatak tales folk tales are the same around the world so our mountain folk tales project is very 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 exciting plus there are four more no four things uh, i'm working on which i won't talk about because i really believe if you talk too much about what you're writing this is a tip to all the writers who are watching that if i found 
that if you talk too much about what you're working on, I can tell you about the folk tales because they are complete. But if you talk too much about what you're writing, you expend the energy. Just don't talk about it while you're writing it. Talk about it later. That's a good tip for aspiring it's writers. Really, I think that 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 the uh, you know the, those lines you quoted you know the great things happen when uh, men and mountains meet. Men and mountains meet. It's so powerful. It's uh, it's like really kind of captures the essence of you know what mountain does to kind of our spirits. The Himalayas are the youngest mountains in the world. And the they are growing. Yeah. They have they have. Mujhe, mm-hmm. I, I don't I see them as living beings. Yeah. It, it is. Mm-hmm. And there, I mean, this is you know the way you're describing Himalayas, right? And. In literature, imagination, this whole idea of mysticism, like being able to feel something, you know, which is a little more ethereal, you know, which is not can be described that easily. Do you think is that also feeling I authors in the so. and One of the books I've recently completed, which has turned out to be one of my favorite books, yeah. it's called Mystics and Skeptics, mm-hmm. Searching Himalayan Masters. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've looked at a, about 24 Himalayan Masters. Right. It's an anthology again. Living it's, Himalayan Masters? He, living or dead. Okay. But not about their philosophy and all, but about encounters with mm. them. What it meant yeah. to meet them. Mm. It's a very good book because mm. it's also got skeptics. Yeah. Because uh, I began the introduction to that book in a very sweet way mm. by quoting. I have many uh. eccentric people in my family, as you can okay. imagine. And one of those who was also, by the way, an engineer in America, but he was also in India a lot and he told me he used to call me Bhagwati <laughs> he said Bhagwati yaad rakho kahi bhi tumhe koi pagal mil jaye yeah. usko izzat se baat karna kya pata wo sakshat bhagwan hai <laughs> right. so you really can't tell in all those eccentric characters moving around yeah. in the mountains mm. who is a madman right. who is a fraud mm. and who is a saint mm. because a lot of the real questers mm. who are not working within the rituals mm. only they just so Himalayas draw them. Your book, uh, this uh, you know, this uh, uh, mystics and uh, and the skeptics is reminding me of I don't know if you have read this auto- autobiography of a yogi. Yes, they talk about this you know uh, um, I don't know what to call it, a character or a guruji, you know, Babaji, in this yes. which is a so it's much a growing around theme. him. It in the, in this is uh, Babaji. Hmm. It's is one of the great legendary figures hmm. who's supposed to be immortal. Yeah. And um, so many people have said they have encountered him. I, over centuries. Over the centuries. Timeless. But I believe that mm. that figure exists and emanations of that person exist. Mm. But on the other hand, about this greatest of all Himalayan gurus, mm. scam be fraud we India me bhoto hai. And I heard, and I hope I'm not disrespecting this unknown lady, but I heard that there's a f- certain phone number. Mm. In Gurgaon, yeah. where Gurugram, where if you phone this number, there's a lady who's in direct connection with Babaji. Babaji, and if you pay a small fee, yeah. she'll answer all your questions by asking Babaji. So, my love, there are mm-hmm. as many, right. you know, spirituality, real spirituality, you have to wrestle with yourself. Mm-hmm. There is so much fraud material mm-hmm. being sold in that right. field, mm-hmm. in the psychic field, in the spiritual right. field. Mm-hmm. That it can really fool you and destroy your life. So, do you think you know the act of creation, especially fiction writing, involves a lot of wrestling with yourself and you know, kind of digging deeper and finding? Like, partly you know, we look at writing as a process where you observe, you are looking at other characters' stories, and you have a way with the words. You are able to tell it. it. But how much also requires looking inwards and being in touch with who t- you truly are? I think that's important. Mm-hmm. To be honest with yourself. And to try to be honest in your voice, because if the voice in which you are telling the story works, Mm -hmm. it means a lot. But at the same time, I really believe that in the classical theory of literature, each book anybody writes builds on the thousands of books Mm -hmm. written before them. Shoulder of giants. Shoulder of giants or just the lyrical voices, Mm -hmm. the structure, the genres, the themes. A poet like Sappho, Mm -hmm. living century ago in Greece, her voice may resonate with a young Japanese girl or even a, a girl who is feeling very frustrated uh, by her circumstances mm-hmm. in uh, one of the northern Indian states mm-hmm. who, whose voice is searching something. So I think it, it looks for a search, but it looks for different registers of voices. Mm-hmm. You can be loud, you can be this thing. 
but the the structure mm. of the narrative the, which you only get by reading so it's the more you read mm -hmm. the more stories you have read and absorbed mm -hmm. the more you can learn from other people who have wrestled with words mm -hmm. and you can then tell your story simply and effectively Amazing. without showing off yeah. because you've learned how to do it and you do it in your own way you, you get do inspiration it. from you know yes. other people but, but you know you have to understand how to make the reader yeah. share your story yeah. often when we write our own stories we tend to try to show off a little or boast <laughs> a little no you have to draw the reader in right and uh, this is talking about you know people potentially writing i'm curious to hear your perspective and you know, your advice to aspiring authors you know i think most people do think you know especially people who read or uh, who observe about the world they think they have something to tell and kai log bolte hain mere ko kabhi book likhni hai but wo ho nahi pata hai what's your uh, suggestion okay, so i give you my uh, i mean i come from a family of writers right. <laughs> my daughter was a very famous editor and a publisher uh, my um, meru gokhale my other daughter shivani has written a brilliant first novel i'm sure do many more mm -hmm. i have cousins who are famous writers mm -hmm. up to the family family me once i thought i mean so many cousins who are writers <laughs> we could just have a family film festival i mean a yeah. family literary festival but they're all very different voices but my advice which i'm giving to any writer would be writer who's watching this is the advice i give standard advice don't be afraid to begin and most people waste their time beginning with the perfect beginning ye biggest waste of time just begin remembering that it's only a holding structure mm. it's a scaffolding yeah. and as you progress mm. you can always go back yeah. dismantle that most people mm. uh, you know you waste your time on that perfect beginning then you say now what yeah. just enter the story begin telling it mm. when you reach the end go back to the beginning you may need to completely scrap don't yeah. be afraid of throwing away mm. and you may tell this you may be in a better position later mm. to tell about the beginning right. and the second thing is there's a time when you can't force yourself to write mm. that's a time when you're processing it mm. when it is growing inside you yeah. once that has happened just and that time take notes and all mm. but uh, when you are in uh, sort of synchronous you'll pick it up mm. and now research is so much easier mm. especially with ai and yeah. a thing so many things right but just after that mm. stick to it Right. Stick to it, even if you're writing badly. Mm -hmm. Write your two, three, four, five hundred words a day, whatever is the minimum you think you can fit into your uh, uh, right. very busy day. Mm -hmm. Because you know, people will say, "I'm going away to a mountainside to write." It's, it may doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. you, great writers can write anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to because they have to empty out their own heads and be quiet. Right. This is my advice. God is good. You know, I think I remember reading somewhere that you become painter by painting, and I think what you mentioned for ten years you were writing relentlessly, irrespective of the commercial outcome or that. Yeah, and become failure. Right, but you kept getting better in that process, and you know, and learning from right. what learning I was from doing it. wrong. Because if the market wasn't taking it, mm -hmm. clearly I was writing something right. not authentic or not mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I'll be remiss if I don't ask you about non-fiction because that's something I've read a lot. I have written you know a couple of non-fiction books writing my third mm -hmm. one and if see I've seen also last maybe I don't know two or three decades non-fiction also has moved a lot now you know people like Siddharth Mukherjee right you know although he writes about science but his like it's it's a, as literary you know it's it's he only tells stories yes. you know Atul Gawande you know other you know really good non-fiction and you know Malcolm Gladwell and so on in Europe and how is non-fiction moved and also where is the Indian non-fiction going because as all these non-fiction you pick up they are like that literally you can't put them down you know these people write this is so well. but first of all i have a quarrel with the word non fiction oh, okay. it's such a awkward word mm. what is fiction and non non fiction is like non veg uh, it's a very yeah. it's a very vague word uh, non fiction correct. it's like opposite of something as opposed yeah. to what it is yeah. actually i would rather call it narrative documentary mm. i mean right. sounds more boring than right. non fiction but you know you go to a library shelf non fiction could be anything yeah. the whole of the world hopefully we are not living in a fictional world <laughs> so everything and how does is non fiction i would love that i think i like that and as a somebody who knows jlf if anyone can change this you know 
<laughs> phrasing you can, you know, yeah, so yeah. We are sitting narrative here. documentary. This yeah. is what we are doing is non fiction. That's right. That's because right. I hope it is not fiction. It's a narrative documentary from here on. Yeah, it's a narrative yeah. documentary. And the harshest, strongest truths, as they say, truth is stranger than fiction. So fiction is very important for telling the truth. Yeah. But non narrative documentary teaches us about our world. And that's why all those aspiring writers, if they are not trying to write the greatest love story in the world or the greatest tragedy in the world, we know the lived details of their lives. And through the centuries when we read books, the lived details of their lives are not that different. They may be eating differently. They may, be, But the hopes, fears, aspirations of the human race, more or less the same. And But the material life is best recorded. And... We can learn from, if, if we treat language as an evolutionary tool mm. and if we treat books as a part of our evolutionary library, mm. then those are the most important books ever written. Uh, what we decided not to call not, not non-fiction, but, you know, these are the books that document and we can learn from them. If biographies or the history of science itself is, is so fascinating or as you said Siddharth Mukherjee or, and that's the combination of imaginative narrative or creative writing or creative fiction and uh, non-fiction what we said. I think it's part of the same seamless writing. I want to ask you about where do you think Indian new literary scene is in the last couple of decades You know, having watched it so closely from JLF where do you think we are in terms of, you know, words getting better? What can get better in the coming years? You know, where are we headed with the or just overall, you know, producing quality literature in the country across all these languages? You know, one of the things that worries me is the divide between Hindi speakers and English speakers. Because Hindi speakers suffer a natural disadvantage unless they are fluent in both. But that is changing because the politics is changing. So if you are good at Hindi, it's a great tool. Yeah. But if you are studying in Hindi, where are the social sciences book? I mean, the libraries of fiction and poetry, they are there. But the um, knowledge libraries are lacking. I think that's a major thing. And many publishers I know have tried to fill that gap by translating but, you know, even the translation process is difficult because the vocabulary is difficult. And if, in, whether it is in medicine or in science, if you're going to learn the Hindi language word for something, what you were trying to say. So the vocabulary for knowledge learning uh, should be able to take in vocabulary from other languages which have become accepted practice. Hmm. I don't know, something so, like... But what is your take on this whole idea of English, which, you know, we... Call I think English belongs to us. Hmm. But let's not be too easy and too lazy with it. We should discover its own rhythms of English. And one fear I have, because Hindi is a beautiful language, but we forget that it's maybe one of the youngest English language, uh, one of the youngest Indian languages. Oh, kahi, avadi, wa wa se, urdu, ye sab milke... And it is a beautiful language. The more I read, the more I appreciate it. Uh, it is also one of the most spoken languages in the world. Uh, it's the third most spoken language, I think. Right. And um, Chinese and English, of course, Chinese, Spanish, fourth could be Hindi. But if you take Hindi, Hindustani and Urdu together as a spoken language, it could be one of the most spoken languages in the world. And what a wealth of literature. Mm. But, but, but. Abhi, beautiful writing is happening in Hindi. Yeah. But, you know, the the power structure mm. is still tilted towards English. Mm. And a lot of brilliant Hindi writers feel more validated once they've been translated into English. Mm. And I understand that uh, that sense. But if you read the same Hindi literature in English... It doesn't have the same resonance. So, it has sorted itself out. But what do you think? Where is challenge? Kahan par hai? Now, we obviously have incredible heritage. and It's an extremely rich language. And you're saying that people are writing amazing books in Hindi and other regional languages now. 
बट डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन में प्रॉब्लम है रीडरशिप में नहीं नहीं रीडरशिप है डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन है बहुत अच्छा है इंडियन पब्लिशिंग इज डूइंग वेल इंडियन राइटिंग इन ऑल द लैंग्वेज मलयालम राइट बांग्ला एवरी वेयर बांग्ला इज द सिक्स मोस्ट स्पोकन लैंग्वेज इन द वर्ल्ड मोर पीपल स्पीक फ्रेंच देन बांग्ला हर वॉट लिटरी और आई मीन एवरी लैंग्वेज इन इंडिया तमिल इज द ओल्डेस्ट लैंग्वेज एंड येट इट इज अ मोस्ट मॉडर्न लैंग्वेज सो all the languages what they say many languages one yeah. one literature it's happening right but but that you the the challenges are here because the process has its own flow its mm-hmm. own bahav and also yeah, access intervene access karke kuch nahi hoga yeah and maybe maybe tra- translation is one let's say there is someone writes a amazing book in bangla but me as a hindi or english you know reader will never access to that so probably no so more and more people are supporting literary translation okay because mm-hmm. literary translation is different from technical translation okay aap samjhaiye mere ko matlab technical translation hai usko humko pata hai ki ye jo hai this is cut and dried theek hai and the other technical translation has to be as cut and dried right. as clear mm-hmm. but if you are translating a novel or a poem mm-hmm. then the imaginative world and the cultural cues have to be explained ab aap kaise usne dal bhat khaya uh it's a completely या उसका मन दाल भात खाने को हो रहा था फ्यूजे ही वॉन्टेड टू ईट लेंटल इन राइस इट इट्स नॉट द सेम सेम बिकॉज द कल्चरल यू हैव टू से देन दैट ही थॉट बैक टू हिज मदर्स कुकिंग एंड फूड शूज टू मेक द सॉफ्टनेस ऑफ द दाल द फ्लेवर ऑफ द राइस ऐसे उसको कॉन्टेक्सट सो दैट कॉन्टेक्सटिंग एंड आई थिंक टेक्नोलॉजी इज द आंसर आई थिंक इंक्रीजिंगली इट्स गोइंग टू नॉट in my lifetime but increasingly it's going to be easier and easier to do literary translation which is intuitive called mm-hmm. but over a volume of you know the both quality and quantity of the literary work we are producing as a country is and is growing it's is good are there more, more younger you know authors are coming yes but there are problems mm-hmm. cost of paper yeah is a problem mm-hmm. cost of printing ink is a problem mm-hmm. distribution channels are a problem mm-hmm. that's why in the jaipur literature festival we have this segment called the jaipur bookmark mm-hmm. which tries to bring the international publishing community and the indian publishing community together to address these problems mm-hmm. uh, gst on publishers is a problem so all these things uh, they will get sorted out but the, it there are a lot of challenges mm-hmm. to publish how how difficult is it to make a living as an author impossible impossible they say you can make a fortune <laughs> but not a living Okay, fair. So if you are one of those few where you kind of become a best-selling author or something, then maybe otherwise many people mm-hmm. do find very rewarding lives mm-hmm. by having a steady source of income. Yeah. I'm trying to say writing mm-hmm. is not a steady source of right. income. So they, not at least if you are trying to write what your heart mm-hmm. says, what your heart dictates. Right. So many people do keep a balance mm-hmm. between their working life and their writing life, and it is not impossible. Right. It is, in fact. otherwise a lot of people who say now i'm going to give up everything and only write yeah. i can promise you they'll spend half the day chewing their pencils or fiddling with <laughs> their thing yeah. because structure is important and if you you if your mind is roaming all the time then when you focus you can write but and even some of the probably most prolific authors around the world they probably write for 3 4 hours because you also need to give your brain space yes, to you know think absolutely. of other things and anyway. right so i think no. it, that's a this probably a good balance you write for 1 or 2 hours a day Yeah. but probably you need to have any tips on what kind of like most will can't go to mountain or you know yeah rent a cabin somewhere you know in jungle right you have to write like any tips about the how to set up your environment so you feel yeah. inspired you need a quiet space mm. that quiet space is as much up to you to create that quiet mm. space to find that spot yeah in your house mm. and i i th- this is a very funny confession but i can only write lying in a bed mm. under the rose right That's my <laughs> even in summers. <laughs> even in some patti is an air conditioner. I say, "Dikha jata hai," which is very bad for posture. Mm. That's why I find it not easier to write on the. But you know, or there are some spots where I can sit down and. So you have to. Your mind and body has to flow. You men, I used to write with a pen and a mm. pencil and all that. I find the heart, and I used to find at that time that the keyboard connection. and the connection to the mind wasn't running so smoothly but we are a evolutionary we are a species we evolve i think my fingertip uh, keyboard connection with my mind yeah. 
is now sharper. And sometimes I find it easier to write straight on the keyboard. Yeah. But that space has to be in your head. Yeah. I never knew this mm. earlier. Yeah, and if I you change that space, something changes in your brain as well? Or? No, because you've got to find that space which mm. you can, I think. Mm. Everybody is different, I'm yeah, sure. Correct. But I realized this many years ago when I went for some very complicated reason, which I won't go into now. I went for a two-day trip with Kushwan Singh, the great writer, who was a great friend of mine, a very prolific writer. And uh, we went to Guj- to the heart of Gujarat and uh, came back and he we were sitting in the airport. And you know, he was so popular with the public and uh, we were sitting in Ahmedabad airport. I-, I was just sitting around looking at things, flight cup shirogi, said, okay, Namita, now I'm switching off. And he began writing his column. He had a yellow pad he said, my, I have to send in my column tomorrow, I'm writing it. And people were coming, Kushwan Singh, Kushwan Singh, Sardar Ji, they were coming, you know. So, there were lots of people around us. He just ignored them, just kept on writing. And I said, if this person can just sit in the airport with all these people praising him, this thing in him, but he just went, he finished it. And then he was polite and he said, Ya Rabini and all that. But I realized then that this pose that I can't write. But I'm sure different people have different nervous systems. Maybe he just could do it. Maybe some people need to be alone, but Jane Austen did write in a crowded family. I mean, when you need the space in your mind. Mm. So, Namita, you got involved with the you know, world of literature at a very early stage and you kind of stayed with it, you know, through various things, you know, your magazine, 23 books, you know, uh, building Jaipur Lit Fest, you know, with, along with your co-founders, this um, Kitab Nama show on the Doordarshan, which also did really well. Like, if you zoom out, you know, this close association with the world of literature as a writer, festival organizer, probably working with lots and lots of authors. You might have seen someone who's Starting out as a young author and 10 years down the line, maybe made a fortune. Ahead among of the, me. Right? Just, just zoom out, you know. What does it all mean to you? And how this whole, you know, this such a deep, lifelong immersion in the world of literature may, does this mean for you? See, I think you realize the value of words, but also the futility to you. There's a futility mm-hmm. in words. I think. Mm-hmm. I, what I've come to learn at this age I'm 68. That's mm. it. I've learned that words you can say a lot, mm. but silence can say more. Non-verbal communication mm. at its best. Uh, and even telepathy exists. Mm. But telepathy is a big scientific word. You, but people don't need words to talk. Mm. And even nowadays, everybody is analyzing body language. Mm. But analyzing body language... Anyway, then people will pose and... I mean, no. Just when two people sit together, there is so much they can say to each other without words. Which is, I'm not devaluing. Of course, of course. Now, this is reminding me of uh, this... Uh, I really like this uh, quote. I don't know who uh, it's attributed to is, uh, you know, don't open your mouth unless you can improve upon silence. Yes. But I'm a chatterer. <laughs> but, but big mouth. But silence. And... Listening to what the other person is trying to say, you know, sometimes the biggest chatterboxes are actually the most shy people. Mm. But <laughs> you, in the right environment, you know. So I, I don't know. I mean, I have no gyan to give on anything. That's what I know. But something has, you know, see, it's not easy to stay with something for such a long period of time, you know, over four decades, nearing five decades, right? There must be some, and obviously you, you also come from family of a literary tradition and a lot of literature all around you. But personally, like, what do you think you reflect on? You know, what has kept you like so committed to you know this whole must, regard? Must be some brain configuration. Kuch nahi to hum telephone directory padne lag jate the pehle. It's I don't know what it is, but right. it's about words mm-hmm. and the magic of words. Right. And I'm trying to move away from that mm-hmm. because everything is not about words. Right. 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 Fair. Fair. So. Because you can get over-invested in words. Correct. So, I don't know what I'm searching. I don't know where I'm looking. But I know my greatest teachers have been other people's words. Right, right. That is it. it. Understood. And you still have many books uh, inside you. I think you 
mentioned your few ideas already panch panch right so let to think will and also this uh, this uh, the folk tales of himalayas also that's one of the five one of the five <laughs> right so i think namita i want to just really you know take time to thank you not only for taking time for this uh, a podcast but i think everything you've done for the world of literature i think i genuinely think that sounds very presumptuous no i mean but i should say i should say everything that the world of literature has done for me i can thank for that so it's probably mutual and so for all of us so all that you. literature has given you given me yourself right, as the author of yeah. two books right. i hope and trust you're working on your third done 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 with the draft of third and i have fourth at his idea in mind very to mere ko bhi likhte rehna hai wo bilkul acha bura time will tell but <laughs> मजा तो आता है लिखने में वो तो आई कंटिन्यू नो बट आई जेनली वॉन्ट टू जस्ट यू नो सी आई थिंक आई एम वेरी कमिटेड टू जे एल एफ यू नो इन माई हेड लाइक आई वॉन्ट टू कम यू नो इन जनवरी लास्ट वीक आई वॉन्ट टू इन जयपुर इट्स रियली सच अ हैप्पी प्लेस यू नो इट्स ऑल्सो लाइक फुल यू नो द द कल्चरल हेरिटेज ऑफ इंडिया कम्स अ लाइव इज अ मेल्टिंग पार्ट ऑफ सो मेनी आइडियाज इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेस फॉर इंस्पिरेशन एंड द यंग एनर्जी ऑफ इंडिया इट्स लाइक यू कैन सी आई थिंक विल डेफिनेटली आई डू सम क्लिप्स फ्रॉम द फेस्टिवल इन दिस एंड आई थिंक वन ऑफ माई टेक वेज आम गो टू रीड At least two of your book for sure. Ah, no, first see, one. Not as a. They may be. But now, Jatho, I'm very curious now. I mean, you have such a fascinating, you know, history and story, and you know, I can't uh, wait to read. So, thank you so much for taking the time for this. Thank time you, Mukesh, for all the things you are invested in. Thank you. In your mind, in your heart. Right. Excellent. At Sparks, we aim to bring to you stories of exponential impact. We share in-depth analysis of what goes behind success stories. If you find our conversations interesting, you can join us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also listen to Sparks on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or any other audio platform of your choice. If you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve, and keep getting better as we go along.